25 years ago, I was a bartender. And I was a really good bartender. I loved bartending. It was so much fun. But I didn't want to grow up and be a 40-year-old bartender. When I was growing up, my best friend's mom was a 40-year-old bartender, and it was sad. She'd get up in the morning or the afternoon, and she'd put on her short shorts and her halter top, cowboy hat. She'd go down to the local bar and sling drinks until two in the morning. And then we'd get up in the morning and we'd steal all the quarters out of her tip bag for our fun money. <laughs> it was sad. We had no respect for her. And I didn't want my children to have that same opinion of me. So I got a job at Televerde, an entry-level sales position. And I was pretty good at it. And I wanted to be successful. And I remember July 2003, I got invited to a really important sales meeting in San Jose, Silicon Valley, the tech capital of the world. I was so excited. I bought a new suit. I got my hair done, got my nails done. I even bought a new shade of lipstick because I really wanted to look the part. We got there. I remember sitting in this big conference room at the table with two CEOs, a bunch of vice presidents, several direct directors, and a bunch of incredibly powerful professional women. Oh, I wanted to be one of them. There was a lot of really good conversations going on. And I knew what everybody was talking about, but I just didn't have anything to add to the conversation. And that's when I realized that if I really wanted a seat at the table, if I wanted to be able to lean in and have a voice, then I was going to have to go back and get some education. So I went back and I finished my bachelor's degree and I went on to ASU and I got my MBA and I became incredibly goal oriented, incredibly future focused. And I did the unlikely accomplishment of going from entry level to executive management, all while working with women in prison. Somewhere along the way, my passion shifted because in the early days, it was all about me, my success, my future, my career, my family. But at the same time, I had the opportunity to work with women like Corby. I'd hire them, train them, coach them, mentor them, and then work with them as they transitioned back into the community and watch as they would become successful professional business women like they are today. At the same time, I also watched the mass incarceration and over-criminalization of America. I watched America become number one in incarcerating people. Number one with 2.3 million people behind bars today. One in two people have an immediate family member that's currently or formerly incarcerated. So what that means is half of us in this room today have a brother, a sister, a mother, a father, or even a son or daughter who has spent time behind bars. And the fact, that's, the, the fact that's most shocking is we currently have the same number of people, approximately the same number of people, with college degrees as we do with criminal records. So it's safe to assume that if you know somebody with a college degree, I imagine we all do, then you know someone with a criminal record. So as business leaders and committed to conscious capitalism and the idea of using business as a force for good, we have the opportunity to really fuel the fire of this movement. And it is a movement. On April 1st, I was invited to the White, to the White House with Donald Trump and a wide variety of other people. I was invited there to work on, with the first bipartisan group ever, to come together to work on this American problem. And what I saw was people from all walks of life, red, blue, left, right, business leaders, celebrities, non, uh, nonprofits, faith-based organizations, all coming together to understand the impact and look for solutions 
to this American problem. At Televerde, we know what the solution to this American problem is. We've seen what happens when you provide people who are incarcerated with jobs, training, education while they're incarcerated, and then real opportunity to build a meaningful career after they're released. You enable them to not only take care of themselves, but take care of their families, take care of their children, realize their full potential, and never return to prison again. For the women of Televerde, the 3,000 women who've worked for Televerde, less than 7% have ever gone back to prison. Some of the other things that I learned along the way was that as a country, we're currently spending $182 billion a year on incarceration. Now, this would be okay if it actually solved a problem, but it doesn't. 83% of people will go back to prison within nine years. And the number one predictor of recidivism is joblessness. And unfortunately, 76% of people will be without a job one year after they're released from prison. So as you can imagine, as you're getting out of prison, your biggest fear is employment. And you know, recently I was applying for a job. I was actually being recruited, heavily recruited for an executive management position. And after several very promising conversations with the recruiters, I was asked to go online, and fill out the application to continue, the formal application to continue the process. And as I did it, I got to the box. You know the one. Have you ever been convicted of a felony? And when I saw it, I flashed back to a conversation I once had with my counselor. And he said to me, he said, Michelle, I know you didn't grow up planning to come to prison, but here you are. You can choose to use this time any way you want. You can worry about what people on the yard are doing. You can smoke cigarettes or you can play cards. Or you could choose to use this time to turn your life around. I chose the latter. But here I was, 20 years later, looking at that box, facing my biggest fear. And I thought to myself, after 20 years, do I really have to check the box? Does it still matter? But I knew in my heart that not checking the box was lying. And so I held my breath, I checked the box, and then I got kicked out of the system with the message that said, thank you for your interest in this position. But based on your experience, you would not be a fit. So, when does the scarlet letter for, from a felony conviction fade away? I made some foolish choices and I did some foolish things, but I did my time. I paid my fines. I've grown. I've changed. But yet, I'm still judged, condemned for the worst decisions I made on the worst days of my life. When does it end? And so that brings me to my challenge today. Um, first, as business leaders, I would ask you, I would challenge you, I would beg you to please ban the box. And then once you do that, educate the leaders in your organization about this talent pool, this incredible talent pool of people, as we've heard, loyal, engaged, dedicated people. Make this part of your diversity and inclusion efforts. Second, I would challenge you to think inside the box. Think about how you could use the box as a competitive advantage to your organization. 
We have a growing skills gap in our country. Uh, with 10,000 baby boomers retiring every day and the technological revolution, that, that gap is growing exponentially. In fact, it's pro projected that it'll be over 11 million unfilled jobs by 2030. So I ask you, have you thought about the skills and talent gaps that you're going to endure in your organization? How you're going to fill them? I would suggest that uh, you outsource to a company like Televerdi, or perhaps you consider building your own prison to workforce pipeline. If you ask a child what they want to be when they grow up, no one ever says, I want to go to prison. Yet this is one of the biggest problems that's facing our country today. And we, you, have the power to do something about it. I hope you will.